Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Svetlana Borodina. I'm a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Harriman Institute, and I'm very excited to have you join us for this inaugural lecture of the work of care in Russia lecture series. So this year's series will explore how Soviet and post-Soviet Russian care workers have been sustaining lives and why sometimes their efforts hurt rather than heal. Starting today, five fantastic historians and anthropologists will de deliver monthly lectures that will help us understand the global and domestic pressures and victories of post-socialist care work in Russia. Check out the full schedule of, um, of the series on uh, the Harriman Institute's website. Before we begin, I just want to say a few words about the logistics uh, of today's event and a few things. Um, we are running this event as a webinar and the audience can tune in uh, on Zoom or on YouTube, uh, where we are currently streaming live. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. And uh, if you are connecting through Zoom, uh, you can post your questions th through the Q&A feature. And if you are uh, tuning in through YouTube, you can write your questions into the chat box. Our speaker, uh, once uh, our speaker finishes the presentation, I'll post them, uh, the questions to her during the Q&A session. And uh, of course, the thanks, I wanted to thank the Harriman Institute and the Russian Studies Workshop at Indiana University for the support of the series. And special thanks to Carly Jackson for her help uh, in organizing and running this event smoothly. And now I want to uh, move to our speaker. We're so honored and privileged to have Dr. Maria Cristina Galmarini open the series today. Dr. Dr. Galmarini is Associate Professor of History and Global Studies and interim director of the European Studies Program at the College of William and Mary. She received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2012. Her teaching interests include Russian and post-Soviet history, Stalinism, human rights, and cultural history of the Cold War. She specializes in Soviet and modern European history with a particular focus on the history of disability and social rights. Her research appeared in many journals, including Slavic Review, Bulletin of the History of Medicine, Historical Research, and the Russian Review, to name just a few. Today, today uh, we're privileged to hear a presentation based on her first book uh, titled The Right to be Helped, Entitlement, Deviance, and, Social, and the Soviet Moral Order that was published in 2016 by Northern Illinois University Press. The right to be helped explores the sense of entitlement to social rights among marginalized groups in the Soviet Union from 1917 to 1950. Her talk today is titled Caregivers and Their Charges in the Soviet Union, the Case of the Striving Disabled. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Galmarini. Thank you, Svetlana. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and for organizing this series. Thank you to the Harry Harriman Institute uh, for uh, providing the platform. I'm really delighted to open uh, this series with my talk. I will go now ahead and share um, my screen uh, with you. And hopefully you can see it all right. So my goal today is to give some historical background on the work of care in Russia and hopefully to introduce concepts that uh, uh, might come up uh, in the presentations of, uh, of the next speakers, uh, um, regardless where they um, speak from the perspective of anthropology or history. Um, to talk about the work of care in the Soviet Union means above all to talk about the Soviet system of social protection. Uh, the system involved many state organizations operating under the edges of various commissariats and implementing social policy in such diverse fields as education, healthcare, family life, housing, and employment. In this talk, I will focus on two of these mass organizations, um, two of these agencies, the Old Russian Society of the Blind, or VOS, uh, with the Russian acronym, and the Old Russian Society of the Deaf, VOG. I will clarify these agencies' institutional setting within the system of Soviet welfare in the 1920s. Uh, and there's, their institutional standing remained stable throughout the Soviet period. And I will discuss how the people working in these organizations constructed their charges. 
Despite their efforts to produce coherent representations, the activists of Boss and Bog were unable to disentangle the most intricate knots of the Soviet notion of care and citizens' entitlement to it. Uh, the labor need uh, quandary, uh, about which I will talk uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this talk, in this, in, in this presentation, was inextricable in the conceptualization of, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, of, of the social rights of deaf and blind people. More importantly, the desire of these activists to protect individual human dignity rubbed against their impulse to normalize the citizens who didn't fit the standard of the model Soviet of subjectivity. The activists of Voss and Bog never portrayed their target population as being in a condition of helplessness. Rather, uh, they systematically denied the blind and deaf people's invalidism. They insisted on the real possibility for their constituencies to overcome physical inadequacy. Through this argument for capability, the two societies moved the Soviet blind and deaf out of the traditional condescending domain of charity uh, based either on Christian or secular compassion. They expressed pronounced intolerance towards those disabled who asked for beneficence. While disabled beggars, street musicians, fortune tellers, and postcard sellers were seen to be work shy and undeserving invalid, who lived off alms, the active members of Voss and Vag positioned themselves as entitled recipients of the state's assistance. In other words, disabled activists claimed that blind and deaf people needed the state care, but not tutelage. They would help themselves through labor and become product productive citizens if the state provided support by guaranteeing them access to appropriate jobs. In this emancipatory logic, the reception of state help was conceived as a social right that, unlike charity, did not preclude self-realization and integration within Soviet society. Now, advocacy for access to able-bodied society on the basis of ability instead of pity was widespread among 20th century disability rights advocates all over the world. However, disability scholarship has pointed out some troublesome implications of a discourse that denied functional impairment and subordinated acceptable subjectivity to the promise of performance. This construction acknowledged that contribution is relevant to defining the right to be helped and conversely accepted the idea that disability is a legitimate reason for exclusion. As Douglas Bainton has suggested, the proposition that equality in capacity justifies social equality in the end simply reverses the argument that differences in capacity legitimize inequality. Voss and Vogue strove to fight their members' marginalization without radically challenging the oppressive assumptions behind the very category of disability that they constructed, that they contribute to construct. Let me give you some um, background uh, on uh, how Vogue and Voss emerged. An active advocacy movement among Russian blind and deaf people had emerged only after February 17, after the revolution of February 17. In the months following the overthrow of the Tsarist monarchy, uh, two groups of disabled activists uh, emerged, the Union of the Blind and the Union of the Deaf Mute. And they sought to harness the revolutionary potential of the moment by campaigning for the legal emancipation of their constituencies. Early organizers protested against legislation that imposed legal guardianship over adults with physical impairments. They used the liberal language of civil and political rights and advocated for the endowment of full legal status, uh, pravi and the recognition of disabled people, people's juridical equality with the able body, or Ravna Pravye. Ravna Pravye. In this initial legal flare-up, uh, the juridical status of the blind and deaf almost exclusively occupied the attention of Russian disability advocates. So there was a focus on uh, legal issues. That would change with the October Revolution of 1917, when uh, uh, the new state uh, gave equal legal rights to people with disabilities in July 1918. And so the status uh, of the two unions underwent some changes. 
they gradually ceased to be independent from the articulation of their constituencies' requests to the state. Uh, they ceased to be independent forums for the articulation of these requests and became more integrated into the Soviet administrative uh, system. Already the second Congress of the Deaf Mute in October 1920, the majority of delegates suggested passing their organization's leadership over to the state. For instance, uh, uh, the future chairman of Vogue, uh, Pavel Alexievich Savilyev, argued that the union of the deaf mute was impotent and unable to advocate uh, uh, the defense of uncultured constituencies in any effective way. Therefore, uh, continued Savilyev, the organization should be closer to the state apparatus and include in its leadership able-bodied representatives from the commissariats of social assistance, education, health, and internal affairs. The deaf activist Sergei Ivanovich Sokolov went so far as to recommend that the functions of the union be completely absorbed into other state agencies. In his opinion, there was no point in creating, quote, a parallel private apparatus since the state is stronger than the union and does everything for the deaf mute, end of quote. A similar desire for centralization was expressed by the leader of the blind association, Boris Petrovich Mavramati. Uh, he articulated this in a letter to the Council of People's Commissariats uh, in October 1923. Vos, explained Mavromati, uh, wanted to work out a program that could be uniformly applied to all organizations of the blind and thereby avoid, quote, arbitrary experiments on the blind. The uniform improvement of the everyday life of the blind, in Mavromati's view, had to be carried out through the state's central institutions. Within a few years from these statements, both unions became all Russian societies. They were endowed with official approved statutes and they were included in the system of invalids producers cooperatives uh, that happened in 1923 uh, for the Society of the Blind and in 26 for uh, the Society of the Deaf. Both organizations were incorporated within the Commissariat of Social Assistance under whose leadership and under whose control they continued to operate throughout the Soviet period. Perhaps because they were part of a public level commissariat, uh, they never became all union agencies. However, the Congresses in Moscow were attended by delegates from Ukraine, Georgia, Northern Caucasus, Ossetia, Ingushetia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Belarusia, and Bashkiria. And their organizations functioned as models uh, uh, for uh, organizations that later would be established in the other Soviet republics. Besides uh, the question of centralization and absorption within a strong and supportive state apparatus, another fundamental issue of the entire period between the revolution and the outbreak of World War II was how to transform these organizations from more small cohorts of well-educated people into society with societies with mass recruiting capacity. Here, I would like to show you some uh, statistics. To give you a sense of how the membership for both organizations grew over the years. We also need to um, point out that the membership of the two organizations was quite diverse in terms of demographics and the nature of disability. The Society of the Blind included all types of uh, blind people uh, with all sorts of visual impairments from fully blind to low sighted. Uh, the Society of the Deaf counted among its members deaf, speech impaired and hard of hearing. The levels of education could also be very different as both societies included illiterate, semi-literate and literate individuals, whether in braille alphabet or in a regular alphabet. The urban and rural, rural constituencies strongly diverge one from the other and the help offered to those constituencies was very different. Finally, there were various age cohorts and professional backgrounds among the members of these societies and they all had different specific needs. Besides these differences, however, uh, there was something strikingly common in the ways the activists uh, and the members of these agencies understood their social rights as opposed to the many blind and deaf who never joined these two societies. So I will focus on those who joined the societies and those who um, 
presented themselves as advocates of the blind and the deaf. Throughout the early Soviet and Stalinist years, uh, the institutional history of both societies was characterized by tensions surrounding disabled activists' partial control of their own interests, uh, the need to run their decisions past the agencies of central planning, and the desire to fully integrate their workshops within the organizations of the able-bodied. Uh, these were strains that had some parallels at the, at the level of individual disciplinary normalization too. In particular, by the mid 1920s, uh, uh, when the state took into its hands uh, the provision of welfare services more firmly, blind and deaf activists were denied the ability to organize themselves in independent groups. Uh, but being consolidated within the structures of Soviet governance was a curse and a blessing at the same time. On one hand, the young Russian disability advocacy movement had to give up autonomy and its members had to undertake social activism within state-run institutions. On the other hand, the two societies strengthened their status and acquired enough legitimacy to enter an intense dialogue with the state's ideological apparatus. Interacting with social assistance leaders and with policymakers as insiders the society's activists were able to advance approaches to the Soviet blind and deaf that positively differed from traditional attitudes towards disability. Approaches that legitimized disabled people's right to be helped without completely denying their agency. At a discursive level, uh, the activists of Voss and Vog strove to achieve the goal of entitlement without disempowerment. And they did that by employing constructs that had significant currency with the Soviet authorities, such as the rejection of charity and the goal of self-transformation. Both societies understood private philanthropic help uh, as a process that cut off any right and doomed the blind and the deaf to a state of hopeless, inescapable idleness. To distinguish the positive help offered by the Soviet state from pre-1917 forms of charity, disability activists attributed clumsiness and passivity to the pre-revolutionary disabled and described them as individuals living in a prison of darkness and using begging as the only way to support their pitiful existence. The members of their organizations instead were instructed to overcome darkness, to prove to the able-bodied that they were not helpless citizens. Among the blind, uh, the related ideas of rejecting charity and overcoming invalidism inspired both the old guard disability rights advocates uh, uh, that had originally founded VAS and the new cohorts of activists that emerged later in the Stalinist years. Uh, for instance, um, I want to uh, introduce to you the activist Popov, uh, E.V. Popov. He was extremely vocal and adamant in denouncing any form of charity for the Soviet blind. He was a jurist by training, uh, very active in the blind movement already before the October Revolution. In 1923, he had been elected into the Council of the Blind of the city of Moscow, and he had become one of the most enterprising organizers of the new old Russian society of Vos. Besides being a member of the society's presidium, he also led a special bureau devoted to the development of commercial and productive activities uh, for the blind. Unfortunately, uh, at the end of 1925, uh, uh, Popov was uh, strongly criticized for the commercial agreements that he had signed with the former owners of some factories. Uh, we are in the context of uh, uh, the, the NAP, at uh, the end of the NAP. And in what became known as the first round of purges in Vos, Popov was accused by his fellow activists of excessively trusting alien elements, such as former uh, proprietors and specialists. The fact that he was not a party member uh, certainly did not help uh, Popov in maintaining a leadership position within the society. However, when the first Congress of the Society of the Blind met in April 25, 1925, Popov was still in good standing and he uh, received the invitation to pronounce the Congress opening speech. On that important occasion, he criticized the treatment of the blind in Tsarist Russia with the, uh, with the words you see on this slide. Uh, 
The old order isolated the, the blind through a piece of bread at them and put them on church charity. Some were isolated, doomed by lack of education and by people's prejudices. Others were excluded from life by the imperialist and civil wars, which shut them up in hospitals and shelters. Some 20 years later, uh, when Voss found itself in a very different sociopolitical and economic context and under the leadership of a very different type of activist, the rejection of philanthropy could still be at the heart of its self-presentation. The society chairman at that time was Vasily Andreevich Medvedev. Uh, he had become blind in 1922, so after the revolution, uh, at the age of 20. He received special education in um, a central musical technicum for the blind. And uh, throughout his adult life, uh, Medvedev had been employed in various workshops and factories managed by Voss until he became its chairman uh, in October, 1943. So he could not possibly have any direct experience of how the blind were treated under the czars. And yet he always opened his most important interventions by condemning the condescension and disabling nature of pre-revolutionary charity. Uh, for example, uh, he clearly made this point in 1949 in a letter to the Society of the Blind of East Berlin, uh, a society that was just emerging at that time. The old imperial Russia blocked all paths and ways to the blind, condemning them to begging in a dark life. In front, to the right and to the left, stood only enemies, the state, the church, the reactionary public opinion and unwanted patrons. The image of the roadblocks surrounding the blind and leaving, leaving open for them only the path going backward. These images indicated that pre-revolutionary blind were not only the victims of disease and poverty, but also the political system that deprived them of any possibility to be mobile and advance forward. Under these circumstances, uh, uh, continued the activist argument, the lot of the disabled could be nothing other than indeed indigence, ignorance, otherness, and isolation from, full, from being full-fledged members of society. Both blind and deaf activists imagined the disabled uh, uh, of the past, of the pre-revolutionary past, as desperately crying, accept us as people, that's a quote. In their opinion, the greatest need of any person with physical impairments was to feel a close spiritual link with able-bodied, but philanthropy prevented acceptance and connection. In other words, because the societies of the blind and the deaf aimed at achieving mutual awareness and integration between the world of the blind or between the world of the disabled and the able-bodied, they agitated against any form of help that would have excluded their constituencies from the supposedly healthy Soviet social body. This was the main reason they rejected not only Christian compassion, but also the enlightenment principle of humanism. Namely, uh, because the private initiatives uh, of single individuals could never turn into a substantial advocacy for the rights and duties of blind and deaf people. In light of this desire uh, for integration, it might seem paradoxical that these blind and deaf activists often related physical disability to lack of culturedness, new culturedness in Russian. As a member of the Society of the Blind said in 1925, blindness prevails in the uncultured layers of our society. In fact, uh, associating disability with lack of culturedness allowed these activists to reimagine blindness and deafness as forms of backwardness that could be surmounted. The society's activists wanted, first of all, to move their members out of the dead end in which people with disabilities had been so far perceived to be, and then include them into the merging Soviet world of life, culture, and knowledge. This was the world that had been promised uh, to all the former downtrodden, and the disabled laid claims to it too. For instance, agitating for educational rights, disabled activists explained that education was a state's duty towards, quote, the dark ones, a form of help identical to the state's project of re-educating the uncultured masses of peasants and non-Russian ethnic groups. Disabled people's access to education was mandated by nothing else than the party's political orientation. <laughs> 
the activist and deaf education expert, uh, uh, Georgi Yusifovich Grimberg, uh, was among the most uh, vocal supporters of educational rights for the deaf. Um, not much is known about uh, um, him. Later in his life, he became affiliated with the Leningrad Research Scientific Institute for Disease of the Ear, Throat and Nose and Speech. And he, uh, Grimberg created a test to measure levels of hearing impairments that is still used uh, in Russia today. Yet in the immediate post-revolutionary years, uh, uh, Grimberg seemed to be more interested in issues of disability rights uh, than in scientific research. The letter that he wrote to Lenin uh, in August 1920 is a clear example of how deaf activists related disability to lack of culturedness. Grimberg informed the readers, uh, uh, the, the, the leader, sorry, he informed Lenin, the leader of the new Soviet state, about the very dark and illiterate condition of the Russian deaf population. Uh, referring to Lenin's campaign about an alphabetism, uh, or against analphabetism, Grimberg complained that no one talks about liquidating illiteracy among deaf mutes. He proposed to raise the question of the deaf mutes at meetings of the Council of People's Commissars and the Central Executive Committee of the party. His formulation, the question of the deaf mutes, echoed other hot issues of the time, for instance, the woman question, the sexual question, the peasant question. This construction emphasized the darkness of the Russian death and made them into problems that is objects of a question whose resolution was an important aspect of the socialist remaking of everyday life. And hence, a question that would be whose resolution would ultimately benefit the larger collectivity. Presenting himself as a communist, Greenberg linked his political views to the duty, quote, to dedicate all my energy and knowledge to deaf mute people. He concluded the letter by arguing that the revolution required him to take up activist responsibilities. In the writings of both uh, uh, societies, uh, uh, blind and deaf individuals were portrayed as waiting for the light of knowledge and labor. Uh, for instance, in a 1924 book uh, by the activist Sergei Golovin, uh, visually pair people appeared as ignorant, engaged in irrational activities, fundamentally unable to express themselves because all their senses were somehow shut down. They had only, quote, a mute reproach in their blind eyes. This reprimand was directed at the able-bodied, the well-educated, the employed members of the collective. It was a reminder of the latter's duty to help the disabled by providing them with vocational training and jobs. Similarly, in a poem, a 1924 poem titled Rays of Light, the deaf print, uh, print shop workers of the Arnoldo Tritekovsky Institute represented themselves as living in an underground corner, a forgotten space, far away from enlightened life. And yet, while they recognized their ignorance and their distance from the rest of society, they also insisted that they were thirsty for light. For light. And they identified the manager of their workshop as the person responsible for providing the help they sought. Aspiring with all their energies towards the light of labor, the authors of this collective poem express optimism concerning the future emanci emancipation and they wanted to emancipate, as they said, from uh, the oppression of inborn defects. I and mean, here are some quotations. They wrote, the defects from birth will not be fully oppressive. In other words, disability activists, activists felt that they had to convince the able-bodied that the deaf and the blind, although presently dark and silent, greatly aspired to knowledge and could indeed gain access to life, to the life of culture and work that was supposedly led by the rest of the country. As the activist Konstantin Baranov uh, uh, said in the summer of 1917, so before the October Revolution, the mind of the deaf mute with a passion of fire strives forward. This concept was repeated at the Congress, uh, at the first Congress of the Society of the Blind in April 25, when the activist Popov added, there is no physical dawn on us, for us, but there is another one, the light of labor, the light of communism. <laughs> 
1928, uh, the social assistance uh, inspector, uh, Pavel Pavlovich uh, Potapin, himself a man with speech uh, disabilities, lamented that those who did not know the deaf looked at them as inferior, unfit, uh, and essentially unable to perform professional and social functions. Of course, argued Potapin, deafness is a hindering circumstance, and it can indeed seem a defect in the performance of some functions. But in reality, deafness is not only a neutral circumstance, but even a positive quality. For instance, the deaf mute have a great talent for the graphic arts. According to Pochapin, deaf people could better focus their attention than the hearing. Although they, quote, still need to work on themselves, they can achieve a high level of intellectual development. Again, Soviet activists did not deny the backwardness of the deaf but rather cast it as surmountable. As Pochapin put it, the deaf mute are able to develop and reduce distance between themselves and normal people. Other members of the societies of the blind and the deaf agreed with Pochapin. Uh, they agreed that it was possible to establish closer contacts uh, between the disabled and the able-bodied. In a 1924 open letter to her dear comrades, an able-bodied woman worker and activist within Vogue explained that speechlessness and deafness did not hinder the ardent heart of a worker from beating under the shirt of the deaf man laboring by her side on the, floor, on the shop floor. Disabled colleagues, uh, averred this woman, perform their work silently and do not react to what happens around them. But if you look closer, and you see how life pulsates in them, a silent life, but nonetheless filled with social interest. In this portrayal, the working ability of the deaf was not lower than that of able-bodied people. Truly, deaf people's introversion was an obstacle to closer integration between them and able-bodied. But this woman tried to shift the blame onto the able-bodied who work side by side with the deaf without knowing and understanding them. Incongruous as it might sound to our contemporary years, the Soviet disabled needed help, but were not helpless. While prior to the October Revolution, the press had portrayed the disabled as aggrieved and ill-starred, after 1917, the main idea was that the disabled, although still in a state of darkness, in fact, had the potential to contribute to the social state as much as the able-bodied. The activists of Boston Vogue realized that if the disabled were to appear as helpless and incurably falling behind, they would evoke only feelings of pity or scorn for their wretchedness. The Soviet disabled were constantly asked to, quote, walk on a pace with able-bodied along the path to reinforce the achievements of the October, be on a par, at times even be higher than the able-bodied. These and other similar slogans constantly repackaged a discourse that denied helplessness and insisted on equality with able-bodied, especially in the field of socialist construction and culture. Commenting on portrayals of the blind in theatrical plays, an activist said, the blind person should not appear as helpless or implausible. To the contrary, he should merge with the real reality surrounding him. The disabled activists of Bosenberg wanted to correct people's misunderstandings about the physically handicapped. They wanted to erase the traditional identification of blindness and deafness with weakness of intellect, with insanity, with invalidism or infantilism. Ultimately, however, uh, this change in popular attitudes was not supposed to happen by intervening with the able-bodied and eradicating their prejudices but rather by normalizing the disabled. As Lilia Kaganovsky has suggested, by analyzing the celebration of disabled bodies in socialist realist books and films, the Soviet invalid could become normative only by striving to perform at the same level as the able-bodied, that is, striving to normalize. It was never the able-bodied who came to share the life of the blind and the deaf, but rather the disabled who were, quote, to be brought closer to normal fellow citizens, become normal citizens through schooling and acquisition of working skills. 
As the celebrated Soviet defectologist Fyodor Andreevich Rao once argued, education made the disabled, quote, human in the full sense of the word. As much as this construction entitled people with disabilities to the same educational and job opportunities available to, able, to the able-bodied, it is difficult to ignore the profound oppressive assumptions that informed it. To conclude, to define disability as backwardness meant to shape the identities of both the givers and the receivers of Soviet health. Indeed, by emphasizing lack and requiring expert intervention to compensate for it, this construction allowed Soviet health-oriented professionals to represent themselves as the agents of justice. They also facilitated the entitlement of vulnerable populations to social rights without truly questioning their marginalization. Because of their defects, people with impairments appeared as the permanent other the deformed object of care, which is continually subject to reform and yet permanently fixed in its deformity, to quote uh, uh, from the work of Susan Schweig and Anastasia Kayatos. Although the capability argument articulated by Vogue and Voss challenged the view that disability and dependency were synonymous, it still failed to be an effective weapon against inequality. In fact, this argument implied that the Soviet blind and deaf people could be accepted into the body social only when they strove to normalize. In the activist constructions, the receiver of help emerge, emerges as an individual living with lack, need, and pain, while also striving to build communism under the guidance of an authority. On one hand, this process reveals that normalization, that is, imposing a certain model identity to the point that it is internalized as liberating. Normalization is a form of violent subjection. On the other hand, since normalization requires abnormality, this process also exposes all the ambivalence of, this, of Soviet subjectivity. It exposes that Soviet subjectivity was produced by multiple actor in the actors in the moment of differentiation. Actives and experts, participating in the creation of a spectrum of Soviet subjects who had the right to be helped, but also stood in subordinate positions vis-a-vis -vis both the agents of help and the ideal, although perhaps non-existent, normal subject. The ways in which the activists define their target population fit very well with the Marxist-Leninist ideological line and the Bolshevik government's sociopolitical agendas. First, the activist understanding of the right to be helped align with the state's desire to handle social questions within a secularized approach. In addition, the premise that people's disabilities were determined by biological and social factors made it possible to intervene and correct them, transforming in this process the individual self and existence within the collective. Finally, this type of social activism uh, promised that both the state and the expert, experts would directly be involved in the economic growth of the country. In short, this activism seemed a viable way to provide social protection to marginalized populations because it was aimed not simply at defending the well-being of vulnerable individuals, but also at sustaining the interests of the Soviet state. It was for all these reasons uh, that after the revolution, many Russian experts and uh, caregivers uh, uh, received institutional support and moral support from their government and were able to keep uh, uh, these this, uh, important positions as givers of help uh, throughout the Soviet period. Thank you for your attention. Wow, uh, great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Galmarini. And uh, I would like to remind um, our audience that uh, if you're uh, connecting through Zoom to post your questions to the Q&A feature, uh, and if you are watching us uh, uh, on YouTube, please type your questions into the chat um, box and we'll, uh, I'll pose those questions to uh, Dr. Galmarini. However, I will enjoy the privilege of asking the first question and, um, I 
one part um, that I, uh, one of the many parts I really loved in your book was how you situated it within the broader uh, European and global context. Uh, could you speak more a little bit about how unique uh, or similar was, uh, was the work that was happening uh, in the Soviet Union, in the early Soviet Union to, to other places? Yes, thank you very much for this question. Um, so there were many similarities. Uh, uh, if we stay focused on uh, uh, disability activism, for instance, uh, um, the period after World War I was the, the moment when uh, uh, people with disabilities themselves uh, uh, started to organize their organization, let's say, of the blind or of the deaf, right? Before uh, the First World War, it was mostly experts. So uh, special education teachers, uh, uh, various type of medical experts, uh, or people who are broadly interested in uh, the creation of museums, for instance, uh, museums of the blind emerged uh, all over Europe and North America. But with the war, with, uh, um, with the ranks of people with disability uh, really swelled by uh, the first world conflict, we have a new cohort, a new group of activists uh, who start to take uh, uh, the disability rights, disability advocacy into their own hands. Now, this, uh, this was a particularly um, positive moment for them because after the war, see, individual states also realized that states had the duty to provide uh, welfare, uh, vocational rehabilitation, pensioning schemes. After World War II, this would have become the welfare consensus of post-war Europe. Uh, but already after World War I, individual states were thinking along these lines. So at this time, in the late 1910s and 1920s, uh, this is the time of the, really the emergence of an advocacy movement that is led uh, both by people with disabilities and uh, able-bodied experts. In this context, uh, uh, the activists from, from, from Russia, from Soviet Russia, uh, appear as particularly progressive, uh, uh, precisely because they're making this argument uh, that uh, it is not pity, it is not charity that will give self-empowerment, that will give emancipation. In line with their, doc with their government, they make the argument that it is a state-supported uh, uh, organization uh, integrated within the apparatus of, of the state. It is through the financial and moral support of the state that blind people can take into their hands advocacy and make the argument for rights. Now, the Soviet Union had a specific legal setup, right? So it was one of the first countries uh, that uh, um, systematically granted, uh, at least on paper, systematically granted special education to children with disabilities, uh, especially with sensory disabilities. And we can talk about uh, mobility, people with mobility impairments as it's a different set of issues. Um, or mm, people with uh, cognitive impairments, uh, yet uh, a different set of issues. Um, but with Vogue and Voss, we have these this societies that are, uh, have, a, um, have a legal backup, have financial backup, and they start setting up their own material base. They, start, they set up their own workshops. They become profitable. And the societies can draw on these financial resources to expand recreational services, housing for their constituencies. In light of all of this, activists from the rest of the world uh, began to look at the Russians as uh, particularly progressive, as particularly advanced. And it will be, uh, they will look at them as particularly progressive until the late 60s and early 70s when uh, things started to change uh, in the West because of mainstreaming, because of deinstitutionalization. And at that point, uh, the entire situation changes. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Teresa Convoy, uh, Convoy is asking, were the advocates uh, who weren't disabled simply altruistic or were you able to find that they um, had blind and deaf family members? Uh, this is an excellent question. So um, those who were not uh, uh, disabled, uh, um, in most cases, they were professionals. Mm, so it was, uh, uh, they had professional interests. Uh, they were ophthalmologists, uh, they were experts in uh, hearing impairments, uh, uh, some were professional social workers. Uh, um, I was not able to find uh, um, 
family reasons uh, for why they were interested. It might be the case, uh, but I just didn't pursue that line of research. In most cases, those were people who made careers out of uh, you know, the profession of, of, of care, of giving care. Um, the, the peculiarity with Boston Vogue is that they were always led by disabled presidents. Presidents were themselves blind and deaf, and that they uh, they, they they had great uh, pride in that uh, because it uh, for them that was a way to embody self uh, self help and self determination. Thank you. Um, okay, we have the next question. Um, how decentralized were government programs? Were they centered in Moscow or were they evenly spread through the Soviet Union? Yeah, another great question. Um, so they were spread um, all over Russia. So what I'm talking about uh, here is uh, all Russian societies of the blind and the deaf. And they were um, widespread all over the territory of the RSFSR, right? Uh, so the of Soviet Russia. Um, the, uh, the presidium, uh, of, uh, so the central committee and the presidium of these societies were based in uh, Moscow. So in the case of Vos, for instance, it was uh, very centrally located uh, on Novaya Ploshad, for those of you who know Moscow, and uh, Vos is still there now, it still has uh, his, uh, its headquarters there. But uh, in all major cities uh, of Russia, they had their own branches. Um, I conducted research in, um, in Pierre and Omsk, for instance, uh, uh, and I know that the societies of, uh, of the blind and deaf in Kermen Omsk were quite strong. Um, the one in Ufa was also uh, particularly strong for Vos uh, uh, in particular. Of course, there were Leningrad uh, branches uh, that were very important. So it, it was quite widespread. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question is from Nick Baron. Uh, were these advocates interested in the provision of care for disabled children? Thank you. Yes. Um, so uh, with children, um, I didn't talk about the defectologists. Uh, the defectologists were uh, the experts in the Soviet Union, special education experts, who were mostly interested in children with disabilities. Um, when it came to Voss and Vogue, uh, of course, children were part of the remit, uh, and they did collaborate with uh, special schools. Special schools were part of the Commissariat of, of Education. So the, the activists of Boston and Vogue um, collaborated uh, with the Narcan Pros or the Ministry of, of Education later, uh, but the school system was not governed by them. They don't have uh, uh, the, the primary say in that. They did collaborate with the factologists because uh, uh, the activists of Boston and Vogue were very interested in this project of self-transformation of overcoming. So a science like, like defectology that promised the compensation of human defect, uh, right, the overcoming of human vulnerability was very appealing uh, to these activists in their normalization um, project. Uh, so there was overlap, uh, there was a dialogue with the defectologists and with the commissariat of education, but schooling was not primarily in their hands. Thank you. Uh, I think here I, I wanted to actually ask, uh, ask a related question about, it's very interesting to me to think about the work of defectologists in Vygotsky, uh, for example, is one of them in the early, uh, so it was the 20s, uh, at least what I read uh, about uh, of his work, and the social component of disablement that they wrote about. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about um, the social effect uh, that um, the defectologists were thinking about and, and how kind of they were trying to address this form of disablement so much just in the, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, much earlier, uh, I find than uh, say, for example, the social model of disability that would emerge uh, quite a few years later. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, 
so as a premise uh, for uh, those in the audience who uh, might not be uh, disability studies experts, or, um, usually uh, we distinguish in disability studies two models or two approaches uh, to define uh, uh, and address disability. Uh, an old medical approach, uh, um, uh, that's uh, an approach that uh, uh, finds uh, um, people with disabilities as having a deficit, a lack, a defect. Uh, they conceive disability as a medical problem that uh, uh, deserves uh, compassion, deserves pity, deserves charity, and uh, necessitate, necessitates the interventions of the doctors. Of course, uh, the medical approach has uh, uh, several nuances, and there is a more or less patholo pathologizing of the people with disabilities. But medical approach is strictly speaking in looking at disability as uh, um, a problem that needs fixing. Uh, the social model, uh, as it was developed uh, in the uh, 1970s and 1980s, uh, instead understands that uh, uh, distinguishes between impairment and disability and thinks that it is the environment, it is society that disables uh, uh, a person with an impairment. This is, of course, a very crude uh, <laughs> uh, description of the models, but I wanted to um, start with it to explain how the Soviet uh, or socialist actually, because other socialist countries uh, um, had it too. The socialist approach to disability was a very interesting mix of the two. On one hand, invalidity uh, or people with disabilities are seen as having defects. So that's clearly the medical approach. And the defect needs to be overcome, needs to be compensated. That all the defectologists clearly said that. They were looking for means of compensation of something that was a tragedy clearly medical approach. But on the other hand, uh, the socialist uh, model was social uh, or shared with the social model, uh, the understanding that uh, disability is political. Uh, in, it, it's the environment, the socio-political order in which we live uh, that determines uh, disability to be a burden or that turns the impairment into a burden. So this emphasis on the social conditions was, was very strong and was something that the factologists strongly believed in. Uh, it, it was also ideological, of course. So the political conditions that created uh, disability were always uh, attributed to the past, to the pre-1917 or pre-1944-45 period, to capitalism, right? So in capitalism, uh, the relation between capital and labor causes uh, disabilities, while in socialism, uh, suddenly the, the, the political dimension of disability uh, becomes less important, or it's not that it becomes less important, let's say, because there couldn't be any self-criticism of the socialist system, the idea was that social and political conditions are such under socialism that they will allow for an overcoming of any uh, disability. Thank you. And another question that I really wanted to ask you was about how can we write the history? Can we speak about the history of disability uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, say, for example, the Soviet Union even? And I'm asking this question uh, thinking about very different conditions and stories that people, blind people, deaf people had compared to people with mental disabilities, compared, compared to people with mobility impairments. And so my question to you is about, can we fairly talk about disability and disabled people as this group about whom we're, we're, we're trying to kind of exca excavate histories of various kinds, or should we maybe, should we maybe write very separate histories of very specific kind of uh, impairments and how people with those particular impairments um, lived through and in the Soviet Union? So I think both. Uh, I, I think, uh, yes, yeah, so specific histories are, are hugely important uh, uh, because they, they pay attention to the, to the specific needs, demands, aspirations, and uh, situations of, of particular um, groups. Uh, of people with impairments, but it's not enough, I would say, uh, because if 
if you if you read these separate stories, uh, separate histories, then you cannot but see many overlaps. Uh, so I do think that it is important to uh, be in the weeds, you know, and look at the single uh, disability groups, but also take a bird's eye view and uh, see the many commonalities uh, uh, that uh, uh, exist, in, uh, exist in approaches. So the differences and the commonalities, right? Um, there, was, there was a certain uh, um, approach to invalidism, for instance, uh, that you can find across uh, groups of disability. Uh, the importance of defectology, of overcoming, of normalizing, the insistence of being productive, uh, the insistence, insistence of being somehow integrated in the construction of socialism. Um, I think that the biggest difference uh, uh, is perhaps between physical impairments and uh, cognitive uh, uh, impairments. Uh, there needs to be much more research done uh, in uh, cognitive impairments and how they were treated in the Soviet Union. Also, uh, age mattered. So children were always a promise for the future. And while adults uh, uh, with cognitive impairments uh, were, were seen as less promising, uh, to put it mildly. Um, so I, I do agree with you uh, that it is uh, crucial to highlight differences and to be very careful in the way we use or I use the term disability, right? When I, when I write or write these histories or talk about them. At the same time, stepping back uh, uh, is important. And I would also ask back to you, don't you think this question applies to any social political order? I think to uh, yes, yes, definitely, and I really appreciate that you introduce more distinctions uh, that we don't homogenize, say even like groups of blind people or deaf people. That we really need to to think about other markers of difference that were um, so starting from age and from um, their citizenship background, their linguistic abilities, and all of that. Their where they lived, and that is very important. I think for me, the question is um, the question goes back. Uh, whether how we translate this, do we translate disability straight into invalidness, uh, which is a Russian uh, word that is usually translated into disability, or what are the tensions between them, especially because disability now, as it is known in disability studies, as well as anthropology of disability, has so much background associated with disability activism and disability rights movement. So do we um, does this change and, and charge the category of disability? And if so, what relation does this category of disability have to, to the Soviet Union, for example? And um, so that is kind of what was my question was informed by. Um, I actually see there is another, uh, there is another question uh, from the audience. So I wanted to ask, to pose it to you. Um, can you talk about how this push for self-sufficiency was connected with the pension system and uh, um, disability groups? Yes, uh, so the pension system is something I didn't address in this talk, uh, but it, it, the analysis of the, uh, the, the formation, the development of the pension system and its changes throughout the Soviet period is part of, of my book. Uh, um, so and actually answering this question helps me to point out something about uh, um, invalidness and invalid, as opposed to pensioners. Um, so the invalid uh, were, uh, of course, people with a disability, but were, there were also, there was another layer of meaning there that has to do with the pensioning system, were also uh, people who didn't receive a pension, people who begged on the streets, people who didn't want to overcome uh, their defects, people who uh, were fortune tellers or musicians on the streets. Uh, while the, the pensioner, pensioner inval by invalidity, right? The pension, invalidity pensioner or disability pensioner in this case was an entitled figure, was somebody who uh, had gone through the process of uh, uh, having um, uh, expert commission recognize uh, their disability, uh, attribute a category and the level of disability. So the, there were uh, six and then three categories of disability. The first one being the, uh, the acutest, 
Um, so full blindness was immediately recognized as category number one. And based on a scheme that uh, uh, looked at uh, levels of impairment, looked at the causes, the etiology of impairment, but also looked at other factors such as uh, um, how many years a person had been working if they became disabled later in life, um, uh, for instance. Uh, there was a, a taxonomy of, of help uh, to really define uh, who was entitled to what pension and how much. But once uh, uh, the person, the disabled person was identified as uh, entitled to a pension, they turned into pensioneri per invalidness, you know, disability pensioner. And that was a category, of, a category of entitlement that was different from simply being invalid. Uh, so the pensioning system is important. Um, the activists of Voss and Vogue, uh, which I, I spoke today, were closely collaborating uh, with uh, the Commissariat and the Ministry of Social Welfare in uh, um, advocating for these pensions, uh, advocating for what they called blind money. That was uh, uh, money that was given to blind people specifically on top uh, of uh, uh, their pension to uh, fit their specific needs for readers or guides, for instance. Uh, so the, the pension scheme is very complicated in itself. It was managed by the Commissariat of Social Welfare, but these activists uh, lobbied uh, with uh, the Commissariat of Social Welfare. And again, looking at these nuances of how the words were used, pensioner per invalidness, invalid. Uh, we see all these layers of meaning. And I, I do agree with you, Svetlana, that uh, uh, invalidness and disability are not, uh, are not full synonyms. There is an overlap sometimes, but often there isn't. Precisely in this negative sense of uh, invalid is somebody who begs for charity. While you can be blind, you can be deaf, you can be on a wheelchair and not be begging for charity. Thank you. I'm going to take the liberty and ask this question still. So I, I was really interested in, uh, in this distinction that you um, talked about briefly, uh, idleness versus so idle, blind, uh, give, them, give them the conditions in which they can work and they become these great Soviet citizens. Now, my question is, what what kind of citizens they become. And my question is about basically productivity. Cassandra Hartley wrote about different productivity regimes. And I'm interested, what, what is this productivity also tying to, does it need to be, uh, does it need to be fully recognized employed uh, kind of labor of employment? Or have you come across this category of um, socially useful or работа, so socially useful work? Um, and so how can you just speak a little bit about whether this surfaced in your work and, and what do you think kind of becomes the, the other side, the kind of non idleness, the ideal kind of model of blind citizens? Yeah, no, fantastic question. Of course, it changed over time, right? Uh, so because the economic priorities of the Soviet state changed uh, from the 20s, 30s, the post-war period and then, uh, you know, moving into the 60s and the, the technological advancements of the 60s and 70s, the changes in uh, um, really in the, in the economy, all these uh, uh, affected very much uh, what productivity and being a productive citizen meant uh, for uh, the, the blind and the deaf uh, and for, for, for Voss and Bog as activist communities. Um, but in, in general, the, the dimension of socially useful work. Uh, um, so in later times, uh, uh, you can, for Soviet citizens, citizens could perform socially useful work without uh, being um, economically productive, right? But originally there was very much a fusion between uh, being productive and being socially useful. Uh, the, the two were, were, were very much fused. Um, the range of jobs uh, that uh, blind people uh, uh, were uh, expected uh, 
to, um, to fit in change also over time. Initially, uh, the main thrust was to move from uh, handicrafts, so you know, brush making, basket making, these traditional, uh, very traditional artisanal jobs for blind people, to industrial production. That was the, the main push. In 1967, Voss declared that uh, the problem of employment was solved for the blind. Uh, at that point, according to their official statements, uh, uh, blind people were either employed in the workshops uh, or that Voss itself managed, uh, or in uh, state industries in some cases. Uh, there were also a number, although very limited number, of blind lawyers, uh, mathematicians. Uh, um, uh, those were very limited numbers, university professors. So some blind were in the professions too. Um, the, there was a difference in gender. So uh, blind men were expected uh, uh, to be employed, employed in the workshops uh, of Voss or in state industries uh, or have a profession. Uh, for blind women, uh, the idea of the good blind housewife uh, was very much there. So of course, blind women uh, had the same double burden that uh, uh, other Soviet women had. But when we look at constructions of uh, a model blind subject, uh, uh, there is a difference in gender that is important to point out. Um, the activists of Voss themselves uh, uh, could be or could not be salaried. So some of them, most of them had a salary. Uh, so the, they, they were bureaucrats, they were uh, officers, right? Performing a function. Um, but there were also uh, volunteers. Um, that uh, visited uh, especially elderly blind in their in their homes, and in that case is the the, the kind of the, the later meaning of socially useful work. I hope this answers your question. So it, it changed over time, and really with economic priorities and definitions of you know what is socially useful social usefulness. Awesome! Thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time, and uh, I think now is a, is a very good moment to wrap up. Thanks again, Dr. Uh, Dr. Galmarini. This was really uh, so insightful and rich. Uh, I, I love the lecture, and I hope our audience loved it too. And I can't wait to see your new book uh, come out. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody who joined us today. Um, uh, our next talk uh, in the series uh, will take place on November the 10th at noon Eastern time. And uh, then you will hear from Dr. Tatiana Chudakova, uh, who will present on her recently published book, Mixing Medicines, Ecologies of Care in Buddhist Siberia. Uh, tune in, we are very excited to have our next talk and uh, thanks again. Uh, have a great day, everyone, and see you at the next event. Thank you. All right, are we?